Hello, my name is Roger Brucker. This is November 4, 2013. We're sitting in my basement uh, in uh, Beaver Creek, Ohio, and I'm talking to Ed Frank. I've been a cave explorer since about 1951 when I uh, joined a group of cave explorers in uh, New York City and uh, came to Kentucky and in uh, 1953 and uh, explored caves ever since. So this is now 2013. So that comes out to about uh, 60 or so years. In 1954 the National Speleological Society had learned of a cave, a very large cave near Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, called Floyd Collins Crystal Cave. And they received an invitation from the owner of Floyd Collins Crystal Cave to explore that cave. There were a number of people who had uh, gone exploring there who were cavers, who uh, accepted the idea and preparations were put together for that. I was involved with one of those people who took me on an earlier trip to Crystal Cave. I knew it to be a big one, bigger cave than I had ever seen before. Uh, so I was eager to go. Crystal Cave was on an inholding inside the Mammoth Cave National Park and it was a private property at that time. So in hindsight one of the things that the owners wanted was publicity to probably help increase the perceived value of the property so they might sell it to the uh, park at, uh, at a good profit. The initial goals had to do with who you're talking to. The owners were interested in simply finding more cave and increasing the perceived value. Some of us cave explorers were very interested in seeing if we couldn't find a connection to Mammoth Cave. Uh, still other cave explorers just went along for the adventure of uh, cave exploring and uh, with no idea of connecting or uh, uh, having that as a goal at all. Every time we would go into the cave through the uh, entrance to the cave, we would pass Floyd Collins' casket. And uh, we would say, come along Floyd, uh, you can come with us. It was partly in joke, uh, partly in jest, because uh, cave explorers generally are not superstitious, but the thought was uh, he would have enjoyed going on the trips we were heading for. We were told by the expedition leader that everybody ought to keep a journal because these journals would be used by a ghost writer to uh, put together a book which would pay for the expedition and uh, would be written under the expedition leader's name. So I duly kept the journal and uh, turned it in at the end of the expedition and uh, heard, thought no more about it. And one day I got a call saying, uh, would you come to New York and help write a book? And I said, what's this about? He said, well, uh, the ghost writer disappeared with the money and the publisher wants either the money or the manuscript. And so we don't have the money to give back. And uh, I said, why me? And he said, well, you're the only person who turned in memoir material. Uh, so. I said, sure, I'll come to New York. So I got leave from the Air Force and uh, flew to New York. And they put me up in an attic in Brooklyn, uh, equipped with tables and typewriters and typists who would come in as, on a voluntary basis. And uh, the, the book was written in a, a short period of time, two weeks, really. Joe Lawrence, Jr. was the expedition leader, and the book was to appear under his name. He was going to help write the book, but he appeared on the first weekend and said, I couldn't get time off, so we're stuck. And I said, well, I'll ghostwrite your part, uh, which I did under his name. He wrote the picture captions in the book. So it's kind of a funny story, uh, that starting off writing a book in first person, my part of the book, and as a ghostwriter, his part of the book. In 1972, we had been uh, in the previous 20 years, expanding uh, Floyd Collins Crystal Cave to include Salts Cave, Colossal Cave, 
an unknown cave, and finally in 1972 we found a connection beneath Houchins Valley to Mammoth Cave, making it the longest cave in the world. On the day that that happened, September 9, 1972, uh, Red Watson and I immediately thought we need to write a book about that because that is the Everest of speleology. So I said, well, I'll be happy to work with you on that, but the last time I wrote a book, I ended up as the second author, so I want to be the first author on it this time. So that's why The Longest Cave is written by Roger Brucker and Richard Watson. There was a joke among cave explorers, and that was that in order to create an incentive for cavers to try to find the connection to Mammoth Cave, that I had uh, actually hidden a dime in the restroom at uh, uh, Snowball Dining Room in Mammoth Cave and I put it on a ledge above the door to the restroom and I told them when they got there they should use the dime to call up and inform us that they'd made the connection. Uh, one day uh, in the 1980s I checked and the dime was gone so somebody has enriched themselves at my expense. Well we know that uh, prehistoric uh, peoples uh, the, these predate present-day Indian tribes. We know that they explored deeply into Mammoth Cave and into Salt's Cave. Uh, we found torch materials in Unknown Cave uh, shortly after we had made the connection to that cave. We found several things, not only burned reed torches, which indicated that they had come in from an entrance uh, perhaps only three or four hundred feet away, now closed. But we also saw some bare footprints in the mud. Uh, a, a larger individual and a smaller individual, which we uh, assumed to be a, a, an adult male and perhaps a, a boy or girl female. You found New Passage yourself in a lot of caves. What would you say is your biggest discovery and your most memorable discovery that, of what you found in your years of caving? Well, let me start with the most memorable discovery I've made, a, a place called Lost Paradise. In 1954, during the NSS expedition, I uh, crawled into a tiny crack and wriggled my way through mud and came into a place where there was a fossiliferous limestone that was made up entirely of crinoid buttons and, and crinoid stems. Crinoid is a, an ancient sea animal. Uh, and I had never seen uh, fossils in such pure form and so many of them. And I named it Lost Paradise because it, to me it was wonderful. And I remember on the way back, the ledge collapsed and I was left holding on to a tiny handhold, which I was able then to retreat to a more secure spot and wait for somebody to come and yell and say, where are you, uh, and to tell them I was in trouble. Well, nobody came, and after a while I decided I would better slide down this rock and keep going in the direction I had going. At that point, the light went out, my carbide lamp on my helmet, on a muddy slanting rock into a pit. So part of the memory of that, I, I must tell you, I did get out alive, but, uh, and I made it in the dark to the other side of this pit. But, uh, so that discovery was memorable in that sense. I think probably, uh, the most important discovery I've made is uh, finding pieces of this route uh, that eventually turned out to be the connection route. Uh, these are not giant pieces of the cave, but they're nevertheless important links in tricky places where you had to look in just the right place and behind the right rocks. There are other large caves surrounding Mammoth Cave and uh, some of the explorers who had been involved with us in uh, trying to connect the Flint Ridge to Mammoth Cave 
got to looking at the topo map and decided that under Fisher Ridge and Eudora Ridge there ought to be a big cave, maybe bigger than Mammoth Cave. So they began in earnest. Jim Borden and Jim Kearns formed a, a group called the Central Kentucky Karst Coalition, which is a pretty big name for two people, uh, but it began to expand as they looked in one cave after another trying to get into this cave system. It took them a couple of years before they found a way in from a property owned by Jerry Roppel. And that uh, led them through a series of domes into a cave system that began to develop uh, at a rapid rate. Well, when a cave system starts to grow as a result of discoveries, it attracts cave explorers. And so many, many people joined that effort at trying to find a big cave uh, that would rival Mammoth Cave. Now, part of the story in, in order to goad new explorers to come was that somehow uh, they had a cave bigger than Mammoth Cave and that uh, the Mammoth Cave Cave Research Foundation crew were trying to scoop their cave, meaning uh, find a way into it and uh, take it over, so to speak. Actually, part of that was hype on the part of Roppel Cave people because the Cave Research Foundation realized that uh, this cave was developing very slowly and it would take years and years and years to survey a cave bigger than Mammoth Cave. So it was largely a one-way rivalry, if you will. Uh, after a while, the, we began to find passages that connected other caves. Proctor Cave was connected with Morrison Cave, and then that was connected with uh, Mammoth Cave, and in the course of that a huge underground river was found, which was named Logsdon River. Well, Logsdon River rises in Ropple Cave, and some dye traces has proved that it's all one river that comes out on the Green River at Turnhole Bend. So it was inevitable then that the caves would be connected. The Roppel people were not interested because for many years they had the second longest cave in Kentucky. Uh, then one day a third party, not related to Cave Research Foundation or Roppel Cave, came along and he said, you guys are nuts. Uh, why don't you connect this cave and if you're not going to connect it, I will. And this was an individual who was known to be a good caver and probably could have done it. So at that point, the Roppel Cave people approached the Cave Research Foundation and proposed that we uh, go ahead and, and connect the caves before somebody did it who was not known. So that's the story, and within a couple of trips, uh, we were able to find the connection through the Underground River. There are other nearby caves to Mammoth Cave. The Fisher Ridge Cave System, in largely in Hart County, uh, is only about 300 feet from passages in, in Roppel Cave, uh, which is also part of Mammoth Cave. So you can see that this 120-mile system that is Fisher Ridge uh, could one day be connected to Mammoth Cave. The Fisher Ridge people are not interested in finding that connection and we understand that, we being the Cave Research Foundation, because we've got plenty of cave to look at for the next 10-15 years, but one of these days somebody will find a connection between the two. Uh, in another direction, uh, more to the west and south, is another large cave system called the Wig Pistol Cave System or Martin Ridge Cave System that is formed by the finding connections between three different caves and that cave system is uh, growing steadily. It's, it's undergoing mapping and uh, it's uh, somewhere around 45 or 46 miles long now and, and always growing. Uh, Logsdon River runs through that cave, so we know that one of these days that connection will be made, in which case the whole system will quickly uh, rise from its uh, 100 and, uh, and from its 400 mile length now to 500 miles and uh, 
Jim Borden and I have predicted it will reach a thousand miles before the end of this century. And so if one can come to a valley, we find that there are vertical shafts that we can go down to the water table, uh, down to the lowest levels uh, near the Green River level, and go underneath the valleys and come up on the other side through vertical shafts into continuations of the cave system. And really that was the uh, secret to finding connections between the caves. They weren't dug, they were all natural connections, but they involved following the water. But I think the, the problem is that uh, Few cave explorers make significant discoveries, and uh, the significant discovery of today is eclipsed by the significant discovery of tomorrow, and we don't remember who made that discovery. Of this lower Ohio, upper Mississippi, would end up in New Orleans or Memphis or somewhere down here, and then have to come back to Louisville along the Louisville Boat Road uh, back to uh, Louisville and start over with the next bunch of people. So on this road is where Bell's Tavern was located.